Ladies and gentlemen, Alex Berman joins us today from the great state of Missouri. Longtime friend of mine, someone who's been out here to Gardenia a couple of times, who I've seen around a lot of libertarian events, someone who knows the message, who knows the game. Very excited to see him stepping up this year, running for U.S. Congress. Alex, welcome to the show. Hey, a long time no see, man. How's that well, audio? We, yeah, it's good. We got a, a little, uh, little wiping sound, I think. But other than that, it sounds great. So, Alex... How is this stepping up your game for you running for Congress? Uh, it's way more work than like making memes, which is what I've been doing for the past five years, working on taxation and theft guy. And uh, yeah, this is real work. You know, I need to actually talk to people, something that libertarians uh, are not <laughs> generally great at, but uh, you know, a little bit on the spectrum is going to help me a lot. <laughs> You know, it's funny because we, 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 we really, I, I, you, man, you went right to the bottom of that rabbit hole. Yeah. Libertarian. Yeah. We tend, we tend to be on the spectrum. We tend, and people who are, I, I mean, what is it that makes us unique that leads us to libertarianism? A certain amount of, you know, intellectual tenacity and unwillingness to let things go coupled with extreme empathy and compassion and wanting to make the world a better place that doesn't usually lead you to social graces does it no um yeah i um personally i can't speak for everyone else but uh i think for me it's just like a rigid moralism like you want to do what's right for the sake of being right you know it's um you know we're not like consequentialists we say, oh well, what are the what's this gonna ha what's gonna happen if I do this? And uh, does do the ends justify the means? Or libertarians are kind of the focused on the means. Are the means just unto themselves? But yeah. also, like also, just me personally, I kind of noticed I got my first job, and I mean like paying payroll taxes job, like uh, when I was eleven years old. I started paying Social Security and Medicare at eleven years old, and it's like. I don't know what age it is where you kind of pass a point and no return as far indoctrination goes, but uh, I'm pretty sure 11 was under it. And I looked at my first paycheck and I'm just like, what the hell is this? What the hell is this? A tax? Ma! Ma! Explain this shit! And it was, uh, I, was, I was never the same after that. So... Yeah, yeah, that'll do it. Now, Alex, one of the things about your website, you know, it's, it's kind of unique here. And, you know, this is a, I think you're part of a growing trend uh, among, of, I guess you could say, you know, warts and all politicians, right? You know, yeah, the, the, uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I got some warts. You know, you want to talk about some of those warts? So we got an hour. We can get through <laughs> some of them, you know? Well, it's, it's, it's the dropping of pretense. And I think oh, yeah. that, that I don't think libertarians, I mean, started, I don't think we started this. I think it's more of a, it's a broader trend. I mean, I've seen it among, and it's, it's certainly a grassroots thing. You don't see establishment candidates going like, well, I'm Jeb Bush and I have two dead hookers buried in my backyard right <laughs> now. And you should vote for me anyway. See, I'm just like every other guy in my situation. I'm really just a regular Jeb. Uh, you know, but yeah, there's part of, the, part, part of the greatest organized crime family in the world. I'm just like you. My name's Jeb Bush. Please, please clap. <laughs> please clap. Yes. Okay. But you know, there's there, for for a long time, and and even today, and, and it's still the dominant paradigm of politics. It oh, vote for me. Put me in charge of stuff. I look good in a suit. I'm you know, I'm I'm credible. I'm capable. I should be the the holder of public office. And, you know, first of all, I don't want to move. I, hey, I like talking about libertarians being autistic because it makes me feel normal. Uh, but no, there's, there's, uh, there's this desire to be like, we're, we're the everyman. You know, every politician, you can relate to me. I'm the everyman, you know, to some degree. And as libertarians, we, we try to play that game. And in a sense, we are in that we're not 
exceptionally wealthy or powerful or oh, famous. Or uh, or yeah, I mean, by and large, country. libertarians are poor. Yeah, yeah, and we're going around trying to say, look, we understand economics, and it's like, but not personal finance. And it's, I think a lot of it is that we are the we are the downturn. We are the, like you said, and, and what you what you said actually really helped me in the sense to understand this. Where like I'm I'm a little uh, I need a better word for it, but anal retentive. You know, like I'm I gotta sit in the middle. I'm like I gotta be lined up perfectly on the screen. You know, military kind of attention to detail. But what really makes us unique as libertarians is it's not just that we have this this kind of autistic streak. I think I think a better way of describing it would be we're morally autistic like we are compelled to like everything yeah. with morals and ethics has to be perfect like no because when you and it's not that it, and, and we're not necessarily perfectionists in the extreme like intellectual yeah. sense like we can make exceptions and caveats but when it comes to what motivates us it's hold on most human beings in the world are ethical governments are not and they're really fucking things up for the rest of the world aren't they yeah uh you talk about red pill and blue pill. It's just like I met a lot of real smart libertarians. Uh, I met a lot of real dumb libertarians. But um, if you just see the government for what it is, like Dave Smith has that great line: "The government is the mafia masquerading as a human rights organization." Oh, um, yeah. You have to be willing to. I mean, like the idea that this thing that you've you've ra been raised in the system you went to government schools like you've been taught um not so subtly that like the government is a type of god and that you know god is supposed to be all you know perfect and that god can do no wrong so to have to arrive at the conclusion that the government is not only not the greatest thing on planet earth but it is probably the most evil thing on planet earth and not only that but you were tricked like you personally you got duped and no one likes that so it's like yeah. you got to be willing to face some thoughts that are really scary and that are really convicting right that the government is evil and you fell for it there's kind of a twofold thing that you have to get through and I think only people really obsessed, like we say, autistically about like the truth and moralism, like we, we're kind of born with that, that thing that kind of gets us over that hump. It's like, all right, well, what's true? And I have an obligation as a human being that thrives off of knowing the most true things that he possibly can and the least not true things that he possibly can, like, um, we have to do this, even if it's scary or if it makes us feel stupid for being uh, duped, being had. Yeah. But uh, it, it, I really, but, um, I, I feel for it's a hard thing to get over, right? But we have, we have to try. I yeah, don't know. yeah, no, and and I feel like this is the biggest challenge for libertarians, I, and I keep reminding myself of the more. I mean, I did it earlier today. This should be the. This is the Adam versus the man drinking game. Every time I say it's easier to fool someone than to convince some that someone that they've been fooled, you have to take three shots or tokes, whatever your, your drug of choice. Uh, but I'm sorry, yeah, say that Adam, again. Like, I like what? What did you just say? It's, it's easier. Game? Yeah, the drinking game is you have to take three shots or tokes every time Adam says it's easier to fool someone than convince them they've been fooled. Yeah, that's and a good one. It, that's a good and it's one. Like that's, that's the challenge for libertarians is that all of these assholes have fooled the bulk of society. And we're not you're, we're not the people in the middle. We're the autistic guy in the corner going, no, this is crazy. No, this is crazy. No, this is crazy. You have to stop. You're hurting people. You're hurting people. Stop, stop, stop. And it's yeah. like, how did you get like this? Well, my mom didn't touch me enough, but she did give me a very strong sense of right and wrong. So, you know, like, you know, I want to get into your personal background a little bit, as long as we're getting deep like this. So, oh, Alex here. on your website, there there are two lines that really stand out. Uh, one, I wonder which ones they are. We need someone who understands what living paycheck to paycheck feels like. Yeah. God damn it, Alex! You're running for Congress as a libertarian. You're not supposed to admit that. Oh, that that I was once living paycheck to pay. I, 
I was once living um, government granted meal to government granted meal, living in government granted housing. You know, this sounds like a socialist paradise, and it is, but it's also called prison. All right, right. Well, hold, hold on, hold on. So I, I, I want to jump ahead to this. We need someone who knows what life looks like on both sides of the bars. So you mean as a there as a go. drunk and as a bartender? I mean, that's great too. But no, we're talking about your criminal history. And if people heard, I, we're going to get to Alex's criminal history. Yeah, because that's the fun part. It's, yeah, it's it's like, it. I, I mean, the, I don't know even know how much he's allowed to talk about publicly right now. Most Okay, cool. Well, then we're going to hear about airplanes yeah. and drugs and all sorts and, and international borders and all sorts of crazy shit with this. But first, just the personal background. What, I mean, living paycheck to paycheck. When you say what that feels like, why why is that important? Why do you why do you say that? What does that feel like? Why is that? How do you want to connect with voters? Well, I mean, a lot of people, especially in this country, after what a hundred something years of inflationary monetary policy, have no savings, right? So most are most people have at least at one point in their life been paycheck to paycheck. So it's just important to empathize with people. Be like, listen, like I know, like I make good money now. You know, I work for some Israelis doing some locksmith and stuff. Everything they touch, touch turns to gold. It's amazing. Thank God. But um, before this, you know, I was working construction, right? Before that, I was a little league umpire, like full time. And before that, well, uh, living in San Bernardino against my will. But um, like, I, like I get that. And some people... Who have never been in the circles like have never you know known anyone that like dealt drugs or known people that aren't in these circles it's hard for them to empathize so even though ending the drug war is righteous and one of the most righteous things we can do um people that have never done drugs or you know live that sort of lifestyle live a clean lifestyle which i respect um it's easy for them to not care about some great evil that's going on until they've, you know, they understand like how evil it actually is. Cause they just don't know. Like they spend their time going to work, taking care of their family, just like going to church, doing whatever they do. Like they don't, in order to see the evil, you have to look for it. Cause I mean, we we're so busy as people um, that it's uh, completely justified for people to not really see what's going on. Um, but yeah, just, empathize with people like just let them know we're on the same level or at least like i get it you know so how have you found yourself behind bars in the past oh okay so, well start from one, the beginning oh yeah this is good was it 10 minutes in we're getting into this beautiful <laughs> all right yeah um yeah for i mean my friends know my family knows um but uh, the beginning, where does that start? So many things led were, up to it. When you were a kid and you wanted to be a pilot. Oh, fuck. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a little too far back. Uh, listen, I needed money to finish uh, flight school. I didn't have enough money to finish flight school. Um, and so, you know, uh, well, I'm, maybe I can't admit everything, but, um, you know, I tried to make some money. I didn't want to go home and tell my mom like, "Oh, I, I didn't do. I, I, I need money. I suck." You know, I didn't. I didn't finish it. You know, I wasn't successful. You know, I decided to do something uh, dangerous. You know, deal on the black market. You know, marijuana, allegedly. But um, you know, no matter where you start on that ladder, right? If you have a half a brain, you're gonna make it, and you're just gonna naturally grow and grow and grow. So you can go from a street level like dealer and then have like, like I said, half a brain in your head and the right person hears about you and what you're able to do. And, um, you know, that, that happened, you know, I got, uh, you know, I was invited out to California by certain gentlemen who wanted to know, what was the best way to traffic narcotics through the general aviation system in the contiguous 48 states? And I just happened to have a theory 
right? No promises. It's not like I was a drug trafficker. I didn't know, but they just wanted to know some theory. And so I sort of just like, hey, these are loopholes, you know? Do you want to, like, this, if this is what you wanted to do, this is what you should do. Um, I don't know how much I can admit to, you know, on, on tape, but uh, one thing led to another. And um, fast forward two years later, I am getting done with a real long trip all around the country. I won't say what I was carrying. It's called marbles. I was a marble salesman. Uh, marble trafficker. Let's just say that. Um, coming home from a real long trip. You know, I think I was in the air for three weeks just going to every... As a matter of fact, this is hilarious. We were... I, I saw you four days before the crash in D.C. Right. 420 in Washington, D.C. Yeah, I went all over the country. Dallas, uh, St. Louis, Chicago, um, Atlanta. New York, DC, all those places. Yeah, I just saw you before it is the crash. Came back to Houston. Uh, woke up in Houston on the 24th. Uh, got in the plane, took off. Did a fuel stop uh, in the middle between uh, LA and Houston. Landed for fuel, put a little oil in. I get 15 minutes. I'm on final, just not, you know, I'm descending from cruise to my home, which was in, you've been to Corona, California. You were there for a night with uh, yep. Aaron. And um, I think I hit 10,000 feet. I was descending to 10,000 feet. And my engine went out. Right? I only got one. I only got one engine, right? And um, declared an emergency, right? Couldn't get it restarted. I, you know, just went through my checklist. Uh, it was just gone. And um, declared the emergency. I tried to make it to um, an airport that was close by. Didn't quite make it. You know where Banning is, don't you? Banning, California. Yeah. yeah, in between those two mountains. Yeah, yeah. That's that, that's where I crash landed. Right, right in Banning. Boom. Off airport. Crashed. Um, Broke my face on the freaking dashboard when I hit this berm. I went through the a fence. I was so close. I was like a, like a couple hundred yards from the airport. I almost made it. But mm. um, crashed through the airport fence. Boom. Um, took out my nose gear completely. Just sort of ground it to a halt. Uh, you know, in the gravel. And I was like, oh my God, I didn't die. That's amazing. So... Only problem was uh, when I crashed, all of that money that was just sitting in vacuum packs in the back, not secured, just <laughs> hit that hit that windshield. There's cash everywhere. There's cash everywhere, <laughs> right? And I'm like, I get out of the plane. I'm looking. It's a it's a mess in this in this plane, this crashed plane. And uh, I know the guy that works at this airport. Like, there's one guy that's there. Like, this airport gets no, gets no, uh, like, so little traffic that they were going to close it down. I think they might already close it down. But I knew the guy, and he was coming up in his truck. He saw me crash, and he's driving down the runway. And uh, I'm like, oh, sh oh, shit, oh, shit. And so I open one of the suitcases. I start shoveling cash in there. Shoveling, I just, like, there cannot be any cash visible as long as there's nothing visible, I'm fine. They don't have a warrant, blah, blah, blah. And uh, I'm good, just as long as it's not visible. I, and I hit everything, boom. And um, I was looking for my phone. The most important thing in this moment, besides the money, was a phone. Because if I could find my phone, I could call back air traffic control and be like, I landed safe. You know? <laughs> John, like a liar, you know. <laughs> but I couldn't find my phone. It was the one thing I couldn't find. I was like, oh, I'm fucked. I'm fucked. And so this guy in the truck comes. I'm like, I'm like, yo, I need you. I'm like, I need you to give me a ride. Right. And, and I was like, take me to the hospital. The hospital. And I was like, there was an Enterprise rent a car, like right across the street, like down a few blocks. And I was like, he gets in the car. He's like, take, thinks he's taking me to the hospital. I'm like, all right, you need to go to Enterprise rent a car right now. 
<laughs> right? And um, so he takes me there, right? I'm like, so I got blood all over my shirt. I go up to the, I go up to the uh, the enterprise and look, give give me a car. I need it now. I got an Emerald membership. I'm great. Just I need it now. Don't worry about the blood. It's cool. We're great. <laughs> she gives me a car. Book it back. I book it back to the uh, to the airport with that dude. And um, I later found out that um, I had been on a government watch list for the last six months. Right. <laughs> And so they had been waiting for this opportunity. Like they had no pictures, they had no evidence on me at the time. They were waiting for me to something like this to happen. So the second they heard I was coming, they were there. Like we get back to that airport and I'm like cresting the runway, I'm driving on the taxiway and I, I'm able to see my plane and there's just cops all around it with their big yeah. guns. And oh, they, dude, they were ready. They were like, we're not letting this guy go. You know, so they show up and I'm just like, I can't, I'm already driving a car on a taxi right now. I'm not going to turn around and just have them chase me. I'm just, I pull up to the scene. I'm just like, Hey guys, you know, uh, this is my plane. I'm just going to get my stuff. I'm just going to leave. I'm going to get out of your hair. And he just, he's like, no, you're fucking not. You know, he, he's like, get, get sit in that car. You're being detained. I'm just like, why? Like, what, what's going on? Like, what, what's, what's the matter? Uh, Cause I, you know, hit the money. I hit the money. Right. I'm like, what's going like, what, what's going on guys? Like you just explain the situation to me. And the, this cop comes up and he's talking about, he's like, is there, sir, is there anything illegal on the plane? I'm just like, no, it's not illegal on the plane. And he goes, uh, he goes, uh, how much money was on the plane? I'm like, that's, that's an odd question for someone that didn't search my airplane. You know, it didn't already yeah. go through my stuff. And I'm just like, what? I I don't know. Like, what do you mean? He's like, about how much? He's like, I don't know. I I mean, I had some money in my pocket. Like, I don't, like, what are you what are you talking about? And he's like, there was a lot of money in that plane. And I was like, I got your ass. All right. Nope. I'm not answering any more questions. You told me all I need to know. Right. And so I, they detained me for like hours. Like it was like two or three p.m. when I crashed. And by the time that they had uh, gotten the warrant to search the plane. Um, it was like eight or nine at night. Right. And so what they did, they brought drug dogs out to sniff it. Drug dogs don't hit. Right. And to me, it made a lot of sense at the time, you know, it's not supposed to be drugs on the plane, you know, um, it, it, it a crime to be rich though. Like what's the deal? Dogs don't hit. Obviously it made sense. Um, so they give the judge, the evidence that they obtained in an illegal search in order to get that warrant. So then eight or nine at night, sometime like that, it's dark. They tow the plane uh, to a hangar to search it. The DEA is already there. FA is already there. Everybody's already there. And um, so I'm just sitting in the back of the cop car and uh, they're just going through everything. I can't see them. And then uh, the Riverside County detective comes up, uh, you know, opens the car door and he's like, all right, Mr. Furman. Uh, so we searched the plane, right? Uh, we found a lot of money. We found a lot of money. And I was like, yeah, whatever, you know, can't be rich dog, whatever. And, uh, and he says, we also found quite a lot of honey oil. Do you know what honey oil is? Adam? Oh, you mean extract? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I never, I kind of knew what it was like, you know, the weed for the pens. I didn't know the lingo. I only really dealt with flour, which is so, this is the weird part. I was like, what, what did you find? He's like, he goes, honey oil. It's like, what? He goes, honey oil. I said, what the hell is hunting oil? And he's like, no, 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 no. It's like, uh, the stuff you smoke, the weed you smoke out of pens. I was like, oh shit. That was not supposed to be there, but it was there. So, um, they arrested me. Cal state of California arrested me. Um, gave me two charges, one for the cash, one for the honey oil, which was like a six month sentence. They, even if it, I got convicted of that. So it was like, not a big deal. Um, and then they took me to freaking, uh, banning. They took me to banning jail, right? I was there for eight or nine days. And then I went to court again. Right. 
and uh, the state of California dropped all of their charges and they let me go. So I got back to the jail, right? And uh, they walked me up to the, the front counter and they're like, um, all right, Mr. Furman, you that got dressed in my clothes. It's like, all right, Mr. Furman, bye. And uh, the two guys standing behind me are like, all right, Mr. Furman, uh, DEA, uh, you know, the right to remain silent, blah, blah, blah. So the, the feds picked me up. They drove me to San Bernardino where I stayed uh, the rest of my, he goes, you know, year long sentence. But um, yeah, I served it in San Bernardino at the hybrid facility. It had county inmates. It was basically a county jail that also took feds and housed them with the county. It was a bizarre situation, intense situation. But um, anyway, so they confiscated all the money, right? They took the planes. I pled guilty. Um, we're not going to trial. We promise, you know, you can you can keep the evidence, keep the conviction, yada, yada. And we all just kind of... Oh, Called it a draw, basically. And uh, I was really happy with the outcome. Uh, I was ready to leave. Um, plus, my trial would have cost like a shit ton of money, like a hundred grand probably to do the trial. And I was just like, just sign a year and a half and we're good. We're good to go. But um, yeah, it was intense. The whole thing was intense. They confiscated like 700 grand in cash. Um, Two planes. We let them keep. We're just like, listen, just keep it, just keep it. It's yours. Fine. Just let me the let me the fuck out of here. We're good. So about a million dollar bribe and um, some other stuff I can't talk about until like twenty twenty three. But uh, yeah, I had a nice, nice. I had a nice in house lawyer. Uh, <laughs> I just woke up, I woke up one day and I had like a, a telephone conference call in jail and they're like, Mr. Furman, this is your lawyer. Or he says he's your lawyer. And I was like, all right, let's do this thing. And he had, by the way, he had the least Jewish name imaginable. So I did not have faith in this guy. His, 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 name, was, his name was Joe Smith. It's like, it's like, that'd be a great Mormon name, right? That's not what I want when I'm under federal drug charges. Right. I need the real deal. Right. But yeah, no, that was, I had so many stories just from that. Like I saw so much and it was crazy. That whole criminal gang lifestyle was cool, which I wasn't in. I was just a pilot. No, I was just like, Oh, whatever. You know, I'm going to fly and hopefully you don't get caught, whatever. But, um, dude, it was crazy. I, I, I don't want to go back. It wasn't great. I did really well. I became a banker, right? <laughs> that was my profession in there. As I, I, uh, I sponsored a coffee-backed currency, and I did a small economic study while I was in there, and I, you know, did a lot of push-ups, made a lot of friends. It could have been worse. <laughs> Could have been worse. Could have been a lot worse. The maximum for that crime I got charged with was like five years. All right? So that would have been, uh, I'd still be in jail right now. But uh, we did good. We did good. No, I mean, I, I, I love your attitude about this and, and the sort of cavalier nature of, well, yeah, we I was flying drugs around and then I, I was in a wreck and they were following me and then I just sat in a little time and now I'm back to like, doing other things i just want to point out if you google alex don't do it Furman, don't do it if you google alex Furman, Drug bust. he's running for office it's going to happen and you so you just and it's an easy to spell name i mean you'll remember yeah. how to spell it from his radio ads if you would you google alex Furman, uh you don't even get anything about him you get first University of Illinois, Chicago, co-founder, head of organizational something or other, and then Silicon Valley, Open Doors. And then it's all these – and then it's you see the images, right? Google image search. And it's all these dudes in, like, button-down dress shirts, like, uh, uh, here's my <laughs> professional headshot. And then it's Alex in the middle of all that with his face just beat to shit with his nice 
uh, nice bruise across. You go, what the heck? Is this the <laughs> Alex Furman running for Congress as oh, a yes. libertarian? Yes, yeah. it is. So you click on, on Google Images, and the first thing that comes up is from PE.com. That's the press enterprise. Man who crashed plane in oh, Banning. There I am. I see it. Had been on Fed's radar as potential drug smuggler, and yeah, it says uh, federal investigators suspected a Corona man. You're hey now you're Corona man. You just live, man. live in Cal You live in Corona, California for a little while. Uh, federal investigators suspected a Corona man of being a drug smuggler even before authorities said he made a hard landing in Banning last month. In an oh, yeah. airplane loaded with illegal drugs and more than seven hundred dollars in cash, a federal complaint says. I mean, part of this, like, this, there's so much stupidity that, like, considering how little time that you did, like, the, the government put this much time and effort into chasing you down because you were moving cannabis and cash. Well, like, they, apparently, they apparently didn't spend enough because there was nothing in discovery. Besides the illegally obtained evidence, there was no other yeah. like they, oh he was on the radar for six months zero discovery. So there's either, always there's always something bigger in stories like this. There's always some corrupt cop who's who's halfway in on the racket or somebody who's getting paid off from like you go down as the pilot and you know you, I, and I don't want like, I know this is stuff that you're not going to comment on but like the guy that you're working for. The guy that he's working for, and the guy that he's working for, you know they've no, got connections there, to pull some strings, right? There, there was no guy above my guy. <laughs> You're sure? Yes. That was it. So it was one oh, dude who was just it. organizing, moving cannabis around the U.S., all over 48. No, it's just he didn't – well, I guess I can't really comment a lot, but he was – Self-employed. Let me put it that way. All right. Well, I, the other thing I'm I'm shocked with is that six months. Or are, are you surprised that they were following you? I mean, do do you feel no, do you feel no. silly like that you didn't? No, I that, I was mo the most paranoid po person on the planet <laughs> during those two years. Very paranoid. So how do you think they right. suspected you? How did how did they get onto your case? I have a theory. By the way, everything I'm saying right now happened in Minecraft, right? Not in real life. You know that, right? It happened in Minecraft. That mugshot was taken in Minecraft on a Minecraft server. It's a great makeup job. Yeah. Say thank you. Thank you. Yeah. A courtesy of my Cessna two ten. Right in my face. <laughs> but um I'm sorry, what was the question before that? Well, I mean you were you surprised that they were following you? No, you no. Uh, I think I think uh, my my foul, the thing, my mistake was um, I entered the eighty nautical mile ring around Washington D.C. Um, uh, basically six months before that crash. I think I tripped, mm. uh, tripped the wire. I triggered uh, an investigation, and anyone with like half a brain would be like, "Yeah, this guy's this guy's." Not on the up and up right now. So I have a, it's my theory. Obviously, then they won't tell you anything like that. But um, that's just my theory. That I'm not so, surprised. If it wasn't for the crash, do you think you would have gotten busted? No, I don't think maybe. I mean, I'm pretty sure I had a Fed walk into my hangar while I was there. Um, that guy just did not smell right, and I just like I thought he was a Fed from like the second I saw him. He walks into my hangar, tries tries asking me questions, trying to he's pretending like he was like like a, a fellow tenant in the the hangar system we had, and I was just like this guy. He he wedged himself through a crack that I left open in my hangar door, and that is not like if you want someone to come in and talk to you in your hangar, you open it up all the way, right? And even then, it's like, oh hey, what's going on? This guy, I, I was like reading a book, I had the doors of my plane open, I was reading a book. And I just hear this guy talk from a, from out the other side of the plane. The other door was open. And he's just like, hey, man, what's up? And I was just like, what is a cop doing in my hangar right now? Because that's just not something that a normal person does. That's what a cop does. You know, I think they're slick. And I, I was just like, 
yeah, yeah. Get out of here. So but, normally yeah. a story like this would deter someone from running for office. Yeah. <laughs> but you're running as a libertarian. Obviously, right? it's a different role. And I, I mean, part of, part, part of what I want the takeaway from this interview to be for all the kids out there is you can have a criminal past and still run for office uh, as a libertarian. Okay, so uh, both of those things are awful ideas. So don't do either, <laughs> especially in tandem. But no, the reason I'm running is because the Libertarian Party called me and they sort of pitched the idea and I go, I'm a drug felon, a federal drug felon. You know that, right? And they go, oh, that's even better. You can talk to black people. <laughs> and I was like, racist, but okay, I see where you're coming from, you know? I'll do it. And I, was like, I said, can I, do I have to spend any money? They said, no. And I said, can I say whatever I want? They said, well, yeah, I guess, you know? I was like, done, right? Well, hold on. There are some there are some caveats to that. Even within the Libertarian Party, you can't say anything that would be. Uh, I mean, we we do disown people. We do withdraw official support. That's but fine. it's not. It's it's never for committing victimless crimes. Right. Yeah. So they're cool with it. Obviously, he was like, "Oh, you can talk about you know criminal justice." And I was like, "Yeah, I, that's something I would, I'm really passionate about. I'd love to do that." And, uh, you know, if I can get a couple interviews going and, you know, spread the truth and speak loudly and proudly, you know, wherever I go, you know, that's got to make some difference, you know, more difference than being in Congress would make, you know, but, um, yeah. Well, yeah, so before, before I get into your issues from your website and, you know, yeah, sorry, my producer was talking to me. I know where it's. So before we get into the issues that you're campaigning on and, you know, what it's like campaigning in, in Missouri, in particular, Missouri and in COVID, I, I kind of want to get, see if you have any like bigger insights on what it means to be that guy in the political race. And, and I want, I kind of want you to be able to explain it to all of our uh, all of our audience, all everybody who might be watching this, and, and hopefully to some of your constituents as well, when you say, hey, I'm running for office as a libertarian in Missouri. Um, I'm, I want people, what are, you, what are you hoping to achieve? Like, yeah, look, there's, there you are in the suit and tie. Yeah, yeah I look and, great. You know, I look like a Republican. You, <laughs> I don't know, man, that fades a little punky. I think it's, I think you could be, I think you could pass for a Democrat. There, oh, I mean... Hell, if they let me run, I'd tell the truth from a democratic perspective. Whatever. <laughs> okay, but what what is that rule? I mean, it's you're not just you're not just the autistic guy in the corner going, "This is wrong. This is wrong. This is wrong. Please change it. You're hurting people. You're hurting people." Like, no, that's <laughs> ooh, gross. If why would why would anyone who does that run for office? No, I get along <laughs> with people. You know, it doesn't matter who. Like, literally, any end of the political spectrum, like. I, we're going to chill and you're going to love it and we're going to do whatever. And that's something, that's something I worked really hard on, you know, to have some sort of social grace, you know, being, you know, the kind of brain that I, I am just like, you know, like, Oh, it's like a screaming in the corner. Ah, oh, that's, you know, what I was born as. But then he, you, know, you just practice being likable and, you know, works out sometimes. You know, okay. So, what if, so, so the, the other, you know, sort of uh, personality archetype, I think, embodied by libertarians is the, the smart ass in the back of the room, right? You know, you're the cool kid, you're snickering, you know, you're the one telling jokes. And no, I'm, the, the, I'm the smart ass on stage speaking to you. That's that's what I am. I'm not in the back of the room. I'm leading the charge, right? I, dude, it's going to be crazy. We're going to have these events, and these events are going to be bangers up in the hood. <laughs> oh, we're going to have, we're going to have everybody there. And if Chief is probably going to show up, Proud Boys are probably going to show up. It's going to be mayhem, but we're all going to get a fresh. We're going to get a fresh cut. We're all going to get a nice sandwich, right, for the guy next door, and we're all going to chill in that sh that really gross looking club. But I, I bet it's going to be fun. You know, that's it's going to be a great event. Yeah, going to have a band band there. It's going to be sick. But we're going to do a lot. It's, we're going to have fun, and we're going to speak, and we're going to just tell everyone the truth, just like Ron Paul did. Like that guy's my. 
that guy's my hero. What he did and how he did it and how bravely he did it. I mean, that's what I, if I do anything, it's going to be that. Just tell the truth, no matter who the audience is, no matter how much you think they're going to hate you, tell the truth. So maybe, maybe I mean, I'm, I'm trying to put a finger on this to like, so I can wrap my brain around like the phenomena of libertarians running for office in the sense that it's like the autistic kid learned how to this it was so like we, we 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 were we were the autistic kid in the corner but we got so pissed off at how wrong things were that we learned how to be cool and socialize and communicate big important world changing ideas to be like no we have to fix this so that i can go back to uh, I, I don't know organizing my my comic books in alphabetical order i don't know why i am the way i am I'm a base libertarian, and that's an even rarer breed, you know, sort of like a, like a Meekock type of thing. I know you're you are uh, in the Meekock, Mises Caucus, and just like I think that is the future of the Libertarian Party, and I think it should be. Um, you know, we have that libertarian ethic when it comes to government, and then we have that sort of traditional. You know, not not everyone in the Mises Caucus is like a a trad person, but it's like hey, like these sort of social norms and these social traditions are not all bad and a lot of them are good and they're there for a reason, but that's like a personal belief. You know, I, I keep that away from my, my uh, perspective on government, which is absolutely completely rigidly moralistic. You know, yes. I'm, a, I, I'm yes. an cap. Yeah. So this you is, know? this is what I would think of as like thin versus thick libertarianism and and the thinner we can keep it the better right libertarianism is voluntarism if you want to call it ancap i i, I disdain that branding but i get it i like you know, voluntarianism and, you can call me that i don't i, yeah. I, I embrace See, that because it's true i, I am a voluntarist speaks more directly to the ethical motivation at the center of our worldview right yeah, well, it's, it's definitely more plain English than anarcho-capitalist. <laughs> well, the uh, the thing about pulling together, I think that's so important. We say I keep my personal stuff out of this. Well, when, you know, when I think of, you know, coming together, well, when we become anti-authoritarian, right, when we decide, hey, I'm not part of the mainstream, I'm, I'm not going to vote Republican or Democrat, it's like, well, I'm a libertarian. I, I'm embracing this unique label for myself. Well, I can't just be a libertarian. I have to be a voluntarist. I have to be an ANCAP libertarian. I have to be a geo-libertarian or a left libertarian or a right libertarian or a trad libertarian or, you know, all these other things. And it's like, no, no. Like, and I'm like, well, I like you're imposing personal preference on a, a lately. And I, I, I correct people on Twitter about this all the time. But like, if you, if you say, if you come out and say, "Well, I'm I'm a voluntarist," but you identify as an anarchist or an ANCAP or a minarchist or whatever, you're you're identifying by your principles. That's like saying, "Well, I'm a homeowners association liberal," or "I'm a uh, you know I'm I'm a nudist colony Republican." And like, wait, no, no, th those aren't, that's not, you're kind of, you're kind of confusing things, right? I am by calling myself an, an ANCAP. Well, what do you say? No, 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 not you. But I, I mean, even like, I, I want to be inclusive and welcoming to everybody. And, and I identify with I the Mises Caucus. Really? What? I don't like, I don't like everybody. I don't want to, <laughs> I will have everybody in my, in my neighborhood or group. Uh, Everybody's a lot of people. I'm, it's actually all people, and I don't even know, I don't even know most people, right? Actually, the Louis C.K. bit. It's like, well, most people are dead. Are yeah. dead. <laughs> yeah. No, it's just like yeah. I I talk about the principles first, and then well, culture matters to people, and so um, I'm always willing to say like, hey, this is my ethic on government. And I have my own cultural identity. And if you do, that's great. Just, you know, whatever. You're, that's fine with me. You don't have to agree with me on everything to be in my circle, right? I mean, there are limits and there are, you know, 
um, some boundaries you can't cross if you want to associate with me. But um, just what matters is, uh, to me, the principles and the morality. I, mean, I think libertarianism is first a morality um, than a, a political ideology. Yeah, no, that's a beautiful way of making that distinction. Now, looking at your website, economic freedom, criminal justice, war on drugs, anti-war, and the Fed, great libertarian priorities. Kind of looks like a boilerplate website. Where's where's the dude running, where's the fun-loving partying dude running drugs on this website? And I know that's that's sort of a separate question, but seriously, how are you using these issues to connect with people in Missouri? How am I using these issues? Uh, well, I think I, we're putting more weight in the events and, you know, the door knocking and stuff. Um, Chris Iniosa is the guy that's doing the, the website. And uh, he's, you know, working hard for us. He's doing a whole lot of other stuff besides website. He's actually the campaign manager. But, uh, I mean, originally this was supposed to be just, I was supposed to be a warm body. They're like, yeah, we just need someone to run. We just want a name on the ballot. It's just whatever, Alex, whatever. You know, they didn't even expect me to make, they thought I was just going to make memes like I'd been doing for the past five years. And they were okay with that. And then, like, I signed up. This is crazy. I signed up. Uh, I drove to Jeff City the day after I got off of parole, you know. And so the first day that I was legally allowed to register was the opening day for registration. So I drove down there, and that was in late February. But I don't know if you know, there's some few things, few events that have occurred since February that uh, have yeah. had quite an effect on the planet. And uh, like I was just, I was signing up for a, a meme campaign, right? And I kind of saw what was going on and I felt moved to make this a real campaign. And so um, I got in contact with my campaign manager who I met at the LNC in um, 2016 down in Orlando. Um, and we we have a team together right now and we are planning our first events and we're going to have a mask burning soon. That's going to be a lot of fun. A mask. Nice. Burning. Yeah. That's nice. going to be. Yeah. Okay. Anyone watching this that thinks that's a great idea and you want to hold uh, a sister event in your city, yeah, DM me, uh, email me. I think it's info at Alex for us. If you want to get involved you know, with that. Can we just start doing those in Walmart parking lots? Because they give away masks at the entry to Walmart. You don't even have to bring your own mask. You just walk into the Walmart and take one and then walk out in the parking lot. We throw it in a pile and burn them all, no? That would be great. <laughs> I'm trying not to get arrested for arson, but yeah, I can be convinced. You know, I can be convinced. Well, I mean, I, I, I kind of want to now – see, now I wish I thought of this. I want to make this a thing. Like, I'm going to – next time I go to Walmart or, or, or whatever store that's, like, giving out masks, I'm going to take one. I'm going to put it in my pocket, and on my way out, I'm going to burn it and make a little video for, for Twitter and Instagram and who knows, oh, yeah. maybe TikTok where the cool kids are. Yeah, we, we want to have a bunch of people there making a big, like, uh, big, big deal big, about it. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, but th th that could turn into the thing like burning bras and burning draft cards. You can start burning fucking masks. Yeah, it's about I'm stoked time. about it. Hell yeah, I'm glad you like the idea. My uh, my number two came up with it, and uh, we're that's gonna amazing. Do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're gonna yeah. have a blast. Hell yeah. So, are you are you going door to door? Uh, we're about to. We just got our voter file back in the mail. And we're about to do our first events. Are you wearing masks for that? Fuck no. Uh, I don't even wear a mask at Quick Trip when they lecture me. <laughs> so how's the, how's the general population? And, and by the way, I keep going back and forth with the foreign pronunciation and the local pronunciation, but Missouri, Missouri uh, how are people Missouri. there actually dealing with this? Uh, I, they're getting better. They're slowly increasing their baseness. Um, I'm seeing more and more people just not wearing masks and just maybe a week ago, it was real bad. It was like basically almost everybody. And I think in the last week, maybe a week and a half, I've, I've really, especially in the last few days, I've just seen a lot of people just not wearing them. 
and I've been so happy. We've been getting a couple compliments for not wearing them, you know. Unless I, I want to high five everybody when I like I, I went to Walmart in Flagstaff, and it was it, I. There were only four of us, I think, the whole time not wearing masks out of a few hundred people. Like it's it's, you know, it's it's about a percent not at Walmart in Flagstaff, and I, I would hope it's a higher percentage of non-mask wearers. But at least when it's that low, I just want to like high five everybody. Yeah. You know, like yeah, no mask or or fist bump at least. But yeah, it's, yeah. it's interesting to see where this is going, and I, I'm really excited to see that you've stepped this up as a way to amplify your voice beyond making memes right now. And this, is, this is very yeah. cool. Not just not that you're that you're sinking your teeth into this, and that your voice, not just because you're a friend of mine, but that I, I, I mean, I love, I love what you represent for the Libertarian Party. I love your sense of humor, and I love your oh. attitude towards this race. It's really cool to see that you have a home in the Libertarian Party. Not where. Uh, oh yeah, we'll see. Gonna, where, oh no, you you know we'll see, none of this. You know? <laughs> no, no, this is what you what you what you're like. There, there are a lot of libertarians, and I don't I don't think in well I think in, like in my campaign, in my presidential campaign, there were some ways that I like that I held back. You know, yeah. I was like, okay, I'm playing I'm playing this character now as the candidate, but I got to mostly be myself, and I really loved that, and I think. Yeah. There are a lot of libertarian candidates who, when they start running, fall for the typical bullshit of, well, what can. Sorry. This thing's going on. This thing's going on. Is this Russian? I'm just throwing this across here. Come and get that, please. I'm so sorry. No worries. My Russian Jew boss is calling me. Well, I'm sorry to give you the bait and switch there. Uh, Adam throws up. <laughs> I'm comment Jim Freedom. Nice to meet you, by the way. Hey, what's up, Jim? Is Jim, did I meet you at the wedding? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was there. You look familiar, dude. Yeah, there was a lot yeah. of people there. Uh, my hair's probably a little bit longer, maybe. I don't know. I ain't been that Yo, long. <laughs> this is how this is how punk rock that wedding was. I was the only one in a suit, and I was getting made fun of for wearing a suit to a wedding. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, I remember that. Yeah, yeah, yeah with, the, with the Uzi. That's funny. The yeah. Uzi in Minecraft. If mm -hmm. ATS watching in Minecraft, yeah, I remember. It, it was a BB gun, just so you guys know. Right? <laughs> Any feds watching this channel? It was awesome. You think they're still watching you because of everything you've been through? Dude, okay, this is hilarious. So I'm a locksmith right now, right? And so. I'm always taking, I'm a contract locksmith, so these customers pay me all this money, and then every week I have to pay my contractors, because I'm a subcontractor, and pay the company. Anyway, so I got tons of money running through my account. I got like, I'm pulling cash out every week to pay these guys, and I'm driving 250 miles a day around this around my city. And so like, if they were watching me, and someone was like crunching the numbers, be like, this guy is definitely dealing drugs right now. And I'm just like, but I'm not. I swear to God, you can look at my bank statements. It's all like it all comes from good places. But like, if even if I was the guy assigned to be like, this guy's this guy's reoffending. Let's get him. But so yeah. far, nothing. You know. But I swear, I'm. You know, I swore, swore to my mom that I I wouldn't do it again. I I would I would think that they probably are still watching, and they probably watch so detailed that they do know it's actually legit. They've already. You know what I mean? That's why they haven't come got you again. But yeah. I don't know. Who knows? You know, that's pretty deep. It's it's given them a lot of credit, you know? Yeah. 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 So so does anybody, when you're going for what, what you're running for there, for the congressional thing. Oh, Adam's back. How you doing, buddy? Hey, sorry about that. If you're getting into it. You guys want to keep going or you want me to, to go back? No, to no. I was, wrap just, it up? I was just doing filler. We're back to you. You're back. Well, hey, do, well, while I, well, all right. Well, while I got you there, Jim, do you have any good comments or questions for Alex? Uh, well, I was just going to ask him if anybody, uh, if anybody has like recognized him when he's in his suit running for office. Has anyone brought that up to him while he's running? You know, like do they recognize them, or is it something that somebody's going to have to bring up on you when you get more serious into the race? You know. Um, no, no one's like recognized me or anything like that. Um, 
So you're not but, like infamous for it or nothing. Not right? yet, but uh, give me like a couple weeks and it's going to be bad. Yeah. You start it's getting votes though, and that's when it'll they'll start pumping it out, right? Oh, yeah. They're going to – I like my local Libertarian Party chapter, they don't even like Austin Peterson. And it's like that guy is a really good libertarian. He's not an anarchist, but he's a real good radical minarchist. And like they're like, oh, he's such a Republican. I'm like, compared to what? Gary Johnson compared to Gary Austin Peterson is less libertarian than Gary Johnson. Mm. And like, mm. I, I remember just like teeing off on him because I was supposed to find the speakers for our convention. And I was like, the guy I want perfect. Austin Peterson, Missouri grown. He's a good guy. Good. And they're just like, Oh my God, Austin Peterson. So it's just like, I'm way worse than Austin Peterson when it comes to like saying stuff out loud. Uh, when cameras are rolling, you know, that's pro that's probably the best thing about you, in my opinion, man. People need more reality, you know. What well, I mean? it, it, it's just so you kind of know what's what's on the horizon. Is that you know, I I work with a lot of uh, you know lefties. You know, I I talk to anybody, right? And you know, a lot of libertarians are not afraid to talk with socialists for whatever reason. But like, I my niche is talking to like kind of like the far right or like the alt right. And I talk to those guys all the time and I argue with them all the time. But so the association, the guilt by association is going to be huge. And that's kind of, that's going to be one of my big things I'm up against, but I don't care because I know I'm a badass based libertarian and I'm just, I'm going to do what I'm going to do because they need to be reached too. Right. Yeah. But that's going to be a huge problem for the, the LP establishment that I'm friends with. And I talk to people that uh, disagree with on us on the right. Uh, in addition to the people that disagree with me on the left, yeah. you know, that's something that they're not going to stand and fuck them, you know, if they don't like that, because this needs to happen. We need yeah. to talk to these people. The Libertarian Party is lucky to have you. I'm sure you'll help them grow. Well, thank you, man. I appreciate that. Yeah. Hey, sorry about the technical difficulties. I'm back in my other studio and I didn't realize how much earlier it got freaking hot in here because I'm back on the bus and it's black and now my phone is overheating. Nice. Again. All right. So I apologize. So if I, if I may just go back to where, where we were and kind of wrap this up and who knows how CJ wants to cut this up for a final product. But what you are doing, Alex, is running as yourself and not oh, yeah. as some fake political character. And I think that's the most amazing service that we can provide as libertarians to the modern political discourse in America, to Americans, to the world. So just be an authentic voice in politics. I think it's really beautiful how you're doing that. Well, I really appreciate that, man. And uh, all of our Twitters are Alex for us. You know, our website's Alex for us, you know, dot com. And if you want to, you want to volunteer, if you're local, definitely call us. But if, even if you want to sign up for our phone caller people, I uh, just go on info at Alex for us. And this is going to be a party. Like this is going to be serious. we got, we got a serious, honest, important message, but we're going to tell it in as fun and most entertaining way as we possibly can. Right. Politics. Congressmen don't really do much, you know, they're, they work for the government. So how can they, but uh, if we can use this as a platform to make uh, the changes that we really need to see, especially in my city. Uh, this city has so much potential, St. Louis. And, uh, man, we have what it takes to really bring about some good change. But running for office, it's the greatest show on earth, baby. And that's why we're doing it, because people watch. And where people are watching, you can you can give them those ideas and lead to actually, you know, go out and vote. Dumb, lame, it's not going to get anything done. I mean, vote for me, please, uh, if you're going to vote. But we, I, my message to all my constituents is, yeah, we can make this place way better, but it's going to be between you and me, not with D.C. They're, they're only going to hurt us, right? So the extent that we separate ourselves from D.C., the extent that we separate ourselves from our local and state governments and make ourselves, uh, you know, self-sufficient and uh, we build our community together, there is a lot of stuff that we're going to be doing in this city that is not politics and is way more important than politics. It's going to bring way more change than politics. But I joined Politics, Inc. just so I can tell these people what's up. Like, we have hope. Like, we can do this. Like, I just, we can do it. We're Americans. Like, we, we're great. We're awesome. We're tough. We're smart. Some smarter than others, but 
You know, we have what it takes to really make, you know, my community really powerful and really good and prosperous and uh, more at peace with each other. And that's what I'm doing here. I'm building a following, building an army, doing a lot of things. And uh, I'm glad you guys uh, appreciate it because it's uh, more work than I was originally planning this campaign being, but we're really swinging for the fences. And everyone watching, that wants, you have my word. This is, like, we're swinging for the fences. We're going to DC to destroy as much as possible. We're just going to take a baseball bat and just start going ham. That's the plan. So beautiful, Alex. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate it. All right, man. I appreciate it. I'll see you. See you later.